Dies Pontibus is a soccer band style block pushing puzzle game. I took a few Latin lessons in high school so I can tell you that Dies Pontibus means something to do with bridges. I don't remember much from those lessons. Dies Pontibus. Push bridges. That makes sense. Soccer band style games aren't going to be everyone's cup of tea. It's been a staple of video game puzzles for such a long time that a lot of people are probably sick of it. How much more can you really get out of the concept of moving objects through awkward spaces by pushing and never pulling? And yet, I still play quite a lot of them, because every so often the game comes along with such a high level of polish, or a strong, unique twist on the puzzle, that they're worth putting the time into. And Dies Pontibus is one of those that I really enjoyed. So the goal of Dies Pontibus is to reach every island and find all the curiosities and wisdom of a small civilization, Or something. It's really not important. Your goal is to reach every island in the game. Unfortunately, there aren't bridges, but luckily there are bridge components. On some edges of some islands will be a collection of squares and rectangles of three different colours, and by walking onto these shapes and then walking into the edge of them, you can start sliding them around on the surface of the water to build a route to the next island. The green shapes are just sliding blocks that you can move up, down, left and right, and they come in a variety of shapes. Yellow platforms also come in a variety of sizes, but these bridge pieces can only rotate around a point marked by a shaded circle. The brown pieces are always a single block wide, but act like a snake from the video game. Snake. A large square marks the head of the snake and small squares the body that follows. These rules get explained by three early bridges, each of which forces you to use just a single colour, and it likely won't be until your first actual puzzle that you'll work out how you can go wrong. Every bridge location has a dotted tile connected to the island, and every platform you use has to either connect to this square, or connect to a platform that's connected to this square. If a platform isn't connected, it sinks. If a platform sinks, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't solve the puzzle, though it normally does, but Dies Pontibus has a very lenient undo feature that you can use to take back as many platform movements as you like if you've done something wrong. These mechanics, while simple on their own, end up combining to make some very interesting and challenging puzzles. Working out how long a bridge you're going to need to build, coming up with an idea of how to achieve that length, and then working out how on earth these independent pieces are going to be able to rearrange themselves to actually build it. Creating spaces for pieces to move, but still keeping borders for them to remain connected is tricky, and it's something that can take a bit of time to get your head around. Yellow tiles need room to spin, green tiles need a lot of help turning corners, and brown tiles need an edge to snake along. These rules, plus one additional rule about electrified platforms that can't touch another electrified platform, which is a surprising element in the game given how rarely it seems to actually appear, can create an enormous number of different situations and puzzles. And that's the other part of what makes Dies Pontibus interesting, how these puzzles were made. Marcus Don Antoni, the game's developer, worked on the premise of the puzzles to create something interesting, engaging, and challenging, but the actual creation of the individual puzzles was a process of procedural generation. A script created possible puzzles and then checked to confirm that they were actually solvable using the game's rule set, as well as, presumably, other curation checks to make sure that puzzles weren't just solved by walking directly forward, for example. The obvious advantage of this is that there are, practically, infinite puzzles and infinite maps for you to play. But this also sounds like something that could go badly wrong. Puzzles getting randomly created could result in something that feels unpolished and uncurated. But that didn't happen. And I think it managed to work because the trick in the bridge building is the interaction between the three different types of platform. And so when different situations are created with different shapes, different layouts, different distances, or whatever, it's still about using your developed knowledge of how each type of platform moves relative to another, and applying it to this new scenario. The other thing it does add is this sense of randomness. Frequently in puzzle games, puzzles grow in a fairly natural way. The developers introduce a new concept via a new mechanic, or teach you how to use an existing mechanic in a new way. And then this is built upon with increasingly complex puzzles involving this trick, until reaching a peak and introducing the next concept. But Dies Pontibus does something different that ends up giving its own different vibe. Whenever you reach a new puzzle, it seems like it could be anything. There's no developer intent going, here's this new trick, and here's a puzzle that can be completed with it. It's a machine going, here's a puzzle that I know is solvable, do it. Do it. 
I'm not saying that's a better approach, and in general I reckon it probably isn't, but combined with the inherent tangible satisfaction of these very tactile puzzles, I thought it was something that worked really well. Of course, there are some negatives, the big obvious one that, to be honest, stopped bothering me after about two minutes, is that the game looks very... prototypey. The puzzle pieces look fine, but obviously the islands are very plain, features like grass don't really fit, and the character you control seems utterly incongruous with the rest of the world. But it also never really bothered me. Who cares what the islands look like if I'm staring at the bridgeless gap between them shuffling pieces around for 20 minutes, totally captivated. This design does mean that this won't be a game for everyone, or probably even most people, but if you are a big puzzle fan and enjoy soccer band games like I do, then I think this one's definitely worth a look. And it's also cheap. But I understand some of you might be saying, but what if I want an isometric third-person puzzle game set in an archipelago where I have to travel from island to island by constructing bridges through a soccer band style puzzle, and where I can occasionally find strange objects with an unusual bit of text underneath them, but I do want it to have a theme, strong visual design, a good soundtrack, a controllable character with a personality, and a sense of adventure, and I don't mind if the puzzles are slightly less interesting. I get it, it's a common conundrum that a lot of people face, but luckily, I've got your back. Another puzzle game that came out fairly recently that weirdly fits all of those criteria is A Monster's Expedition through Puzzling Exhibitions. And because these two games had so many similarities, I've released both reviews at the same time, so if you're interested in that game, it's on the screen right now. Thank you for watching, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.